Thank you, Emily. Uh, my name is Su Chen Bu, and today I will talk to you about the amazing ability of yeast to survive without water. Desiccation tolerance is the ability of an organism to withstand removal as, of as much as 95% of its intracellular water and be able to resume normal metabolism upon rehydration. Few organisms are desiccation tolerant, like tardigrades, nematodes, rotifers, and resurrecting plants. Humans and most organisms are not desiccation tolerant. <laughs> that is what happens to us if we get dried out. The molecular basis for desiccation tolerance remains unknown, but it is believed to depend on the organism's ability to mitigate the consequences of different stresses. Some of the applications possible from understanding desiccation tolerance are the ability to preserve proteins, drugs, and food in a dry state. For example, red blood cell storage requires a cold environment, preventing it from being transported long distances. If we understand how desiccation tolerance works, we can possibly desiccate red blood cells, human platelets, and sperm cells for storage and transportation. So we obviously can't study desiccation tolerance in humans, and it is hard for us to study it in these organisms as well. But luckily for us, yeast is desiccation tolerant, providing us with the perfect organism to study this phenomenon. We're all familiar with yeast. It's that dry yellow powder that makes our bread rise and our beer taste good. You find them in their desiccated form in these small packets, ready to use upon rehydration. We study desiccation tolerance in yeast because it is an outstanding organism. It has a short generation time, it is easily cultured, and most importantly, it's easy to manipulate genetically. Most organisms have two copies of each gene. Let's say gene X, gene Y, and gene Z are all important for desiccation tolerance. In most organisms, in order to disrupt tolerance, we need to delete both those genes. Yeast can survive with just one copy of their chromosome. Therefore, mutating just one copy is enough to disrupt desiccation tolerance. In the laboratory, yeast cells have two phases of growth. Logarithmic phase is when the yeast are fermenting the sugar, dividing, and turning it into ethanol. This is an important process where bread and beer are made. When all the energy source in the culture is exhausted, the cells become quiescent, meaning they stop growing and the um, cultures enter stationary phase. Desiccation tolerance is only occurs in yeast in stationary phase, when growth is stopped. Therefore, there must be something in stationary phase and not in log phase causing this difference of the cells being desiccation tolerant. One such molecule that fits this criteria is called trillose. Trillose is a sugar, more specifically a disaccharide making phase of two glucose molecules, it has been shown to accumulate in high levels in most desiccation tolerant organisms. And in yeast, it only accumulates in the stationary phase. <coughs> Trillose has been hypothesized to stabilize proteins and preserve membranes during desiccation. So normally, water is essential for proteins to function properly and for it to fold. However, when water is gone, the protein is able to unfold, lose its structure, and therefore its function. Trillose acts to replace water and keeping the proteins folded and functioning. Yeast are able to synthesize trillose from glucose. This process requires a couple of different enzymes. For, uh, for this purpose, I focused on the enzyme TPS1, trillose 6-phosphate synthase. This is the first enzyme in the pathway to synthesizing trillose. Therefore, when I delete TPS1, no trillose is produced in the cell. Previous work done by Dr. Tapia in the caution lab has shown that when the triolose biosynthesis pathway was inactivated, TPS1 delta, there was no significant change in tolerance. Looking at this graph, this shows the percent of cells alive after desiccation in a logarithmic scale, meaning that each step is a tenfold difference. However, when you compare the no triolose mutant with the wild type, there is no significant change in desiccation tolerance. So we suspect that triolose's function in desiccation tolerance may have been obscured by other molecules that yeast has to facilitate tolerance. 
So why doesn't taking away triolose biosynthesis cause the cells to become sensitive to desiccation? To understand this, imagine an airplane flying in the air. What happens if the engine malfunctions or the electricity goes out? Technical problems occur all the time, so why don't planes come crashing down every week? This is because every function in a plane is duplicated to anticipate problems. There are backup electricity, engines, etc. There's redundancy. Most plane crashes occur because many simultaneously occurring problems occur. This is exactly the same phenomenon in yeast and other organisms. Almost every function is backed up by redundant genes and molecules. Let's say TPS1 is required for desiccation tolerance. However, when we delete TPS1, it's like taking out one of these engines. The other engine is still there, in this case, gene X, to facilitate tolerance. Therefore, we need to make the cell, to make the cell desiccation sensitive, we need to find and delete both these genes to make that function to make the cell tolerant. To do this, I utilize a basic genetic principle called the genetic cross. The general idea is this. You have a dog with white fur, and you'd really like to see what this dog with white fur would look like with all the other dog traits, like floppy ears, long tail, short hair, etc. For this example, let's focus on the floppy ears. You take these two parents, mate them, let them have offspring, and then choose from many offspring the dog with the white fur, floppy ears. <laughs> This is the same basic principle that I use for my screen. To do this in yeast on a large scale, I use a technique called the Synthetic Genetic Array Analysis, or SGA. Using this technique, I am able to make two strains, each containing one trait that I want, and then select for both traits in the project. In my case, I need to cross my triolose mutant with the rest of the 4,700 mutants that yeast has. And normally, a robot like this is used in most labs to conduct this assay, but in my case, I am that robot. <laughs> so just like in dogs, we start out with the no triolose mutant, and I want to mate that parent with the rest of the 4,700 mutants that yeast has one by one. We let the yeast mate, have offspring, and then choose through a selection of, a series of selection, the strain with both mutations. After obtaining my double mutant from before, I grow them up to stationary phase in these little wells, each strain per well. Then I take each strain and spot a few cells onto solid media and let these grow. The same strains, I let dry, rehydrate, and then do the same spotting process as before. And after all these grow up, I compare the differences between these two plates. This is an example of what a plate looks like. These white spots, are all patches of yeast cells that grew up from the few cells that were, be that were there to begin with. Um, we can determine how alive these strains are by looking at how dense these patches are. Let's look at one row more closely. This left side is the control with no drying, while this right side, these strains have been dried, left in a dried state for six days. You can see that all these cells grew up very nicely, but on the right, you see Number three and number five did not go so well, showing that these were sensitive to the drying process. But we took all the desiccation sensitive strains from the screen and put them into this preliminary category graph based on their functions. Out of the 2,100 genes I've tested so far, 60, 64 were desiccation sensitive. Now, as you can see, of the 64 genes, mitochondrial mutants have the most significant effect on desiccation tolerance, something that our lab already knew. However, there were no obvious categories that the other strains fit into. So to continue, I picked a few genes that seemed interesting for the testing. However, before I continued, I discovered an exciting problem, or I'd like to think an interesting phenotype. When performing the desiccation assay, I noticed that cells were dying even without any desiccation stress. To examine this further, I conducted what we call a methylene blue staining experiment. Methylene blue is a dye that is used to tell the difference between dead and alive cells. Dead cells become blue, while alive cells remain white. Therefore, we can identify the number of cell deaths by counting the number of blue cells 
within our sample. <coughs> Shown here is a strain with no trios, um, stained with methylene blue. And you can see that most of these cells remain white, meaning that they are 98% alive. Well, on the right here, I have a trilos and a target gene double mutant. And you see that most of the cells are dark, meaning that they're only 18% alive. This is a more quantitative view of what I just showed you. Again, this is the graph measuring total number of cells alive in a logarithmic scale. You see that wild type and no trilos mutant alone have cells that are mostly alive. However, if you have two mutations, no trilos and another target gene, there's a huge drop in the number of cells that are alive. Going back to the life of yeast, the death seems to be occurring when the yeast cultures enter a stationary phase. Normally at stationary phase, each cell is considered to be quiescent. But in the case of these six strains, the combination of no trilos and no target gene is causing the cells to possibly not reach quiescence or die in quiescence. This is extremely interesting because quiescence is not largely studied, even though almost every organism has most of its cells in quiescence. So in conclusion, we found that trilo seems to have a function in cells surviving quiescence. It's poss it possibly explains why trilo accumulates only in stationary phase when these cells are in quiescence. To be able to understand how these cells survive quiescence might also give us insight on why quiescence is so important in other organisms, like this tree, which only has few cells growing and dividing. The rest are in quiescence. It might also tell us how yeast survive desiccation tolerance in this state and allow us to apply this knowledge to other organisms. One of the most exciting aspects of science is being able to discover something unexpected. I started the research looking for genes important in desiccation tolerance. However, along the way, I've discovered an unexpected result that branches my research into also studying questions. I want to thank all of my mentors and the rest of the Koshman Lab, as well as everyone at CERF, for their help and uh, 